Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, Excerpt 4, The Fight with Covey. Background. When he was 16, Douglas was sent to a new master, Thomas Ald, who owned a plantation in St. Michael's, Maryland. Ald found Douglas defiant and rented him out for one year to a nearby farmer, Edward Covey, who had a reputation for breaking slaves. Paragraph 1. I had left Master Thomas's house and went to live with Mr. Covey on the 1st of January, 1833. I was now, for the first time in my life, a field hand. Paragraph 2. I lived with Mr. Covey one year. During the first six months of that year, scarce a week passed without his whipping me. I was seldom free from a sore back. My awkwardness was almost always his excuse for whipping me. We were worked fully up to the point of endurance. Long before the day we were up, our horses fed, and by the first approach of day, we were off to the field with our hoes and plowing teams. Mr. Covey gave us enough to eat, but scarce time to eat it. We were often less than five minutes in taking our meals. We were often in the field from the first approach of day till its last lingering ray had left us. And at saving fodder time, midnight often caught us in the field binding blades. Paragraph three. Covey would be out with us. The way he used to stand it was this. He would spend most of his afternoon in bed. He would then come out fresh in the evening, ready to urge us on with his words. Example and frequently with the whip. Mr. Covey was one of the few slaveholders who could and did work with his hands. He was a hard-working man. He knew by himself just what a man or boy could do. There was no deceiving him. His work went on in his absence, almost as well as in his presence. And he had the faculty of making us feel that he was ever present with us. This he did by surprising us. He seldom approached the spot where we were at work openly, if he could do it secretly. He always aimed at taking us by surprise. Such was his cunning that we used to call him, among ourselves, the snake. When we were at work in the cornfield, he would sometimes crawl on his hands and knees to avoid detection. And all at once he would rise, nearly in our midst, and scream out, ha, ha, come, come, dash on, dash on. This being his mode of attack, it was never safe to stop a single minute. His comings were like a thief in the night. He appeared to us as being ever at hand. He was under every tree, behind every stump, in every bush, and at every window on the plantation. Paragraph four. If at any one time of my life, more than another, I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that was during the first six months of my stay with Mr. Covey. We were worked in all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, hail, or snow too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day of the night. The longest days were too short for him, and the shortest nights too long for him. I was somewhat unmanageable when I first went there, but a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed. My intellect languished. The disposition to read departed. The cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me. And behold, a man transformed into a brute. Paragraph 5. Sunday was my only leisure time. I spent this in a sort of beast-like stupor, between sleep and wake, under some large tree. At times I would rise up, a flash of energetic freedom, would dart through my soul, accompanied with a faint beam of hope that flickered for a moment and then vanished. 
I sank down again, mourning over my wretched condition. I was sometimes prompted to take my life, and that of Covey, but was prevented by a combination of hope and fear. My sufferings on this plantation seemed now like a dream rather than a stern reality. Paragraph 6. I have already intimated that my condition was much worse during the first six months of my stay at Mr. Covey's than in the last six. The circumstances leading to the change in Mr. Covey's course towards me form an epoch in my humble history. You have seen how a man was made a slave. You shall see how a slave was made a man. Paragraph 7. On one of the hottest days of the month of August, 1833, Bill Smith, William Hughes, a slave named Eli, and myself were engaged in fanning wheat. Hughes was clearing the fanned wheat from the, before the fan. Eli was turning, Smith was feeding, and I was carrying wheat to the fan. The work was simple, requiring strength rather than intellect. Yet, to one entirely unused to such work, it came very hard. About three o'clock of that day, I broke down. My strength failed me. I was seized with a violent aching of the head, attended with extreme dizziness. I trembled in every limb. Finding what was coming, I nerved myself up, feeling it would never do to stop work. I stood as long as I could stagger to the hopper with green. When I could stand no longer, I fell, and felt as if held down by an immense weight. The fan, of course, stopped. Everyone had his own work to do, and no one could do the work of the other and have his own go on at the same time. Paragraph 8. Mr. Covey was at the house, about 100 yards from the treading yard where we were fanning. On hearing the fan stop, he left immediately and came to the spot where we were. He hastily inquired what the matter was. Bill answered that I was sick and there was no one to bring wheat to the fan. I had by this time crawled away under the side of the post and rail fence by which the yard was enclosed, hoping to find relief by getting out of the sun. He then asked where I was. He was told by one of the hands. He came to the spot and after looking at me a while, asked me what was the matter. I told him as well as I could, for I scarce had the strength to speak. He then gave me a savage kick in the side and told me to get up. I tried to do so, but fell back in the attempt. He gave me another kick and again told me to rise. I again tried and succeeded in gaining my feet, but stooping to get the tub with which I was feeding the fan, I again staggered and fell. While down in this situation, Mr. Covey took up the hickory slat with which Hughes had been striking off the half bushel measure, and with it gave me a heavy blow upon the head, making a large wound, and the blood ran freely, and with this again told me to get up. I made no effort to comply, having now made up my mind to let him do his worst. In a short time after receiving this blow, my head grew better. Mr. Covey had now left me to my feet. Douglas at this point decided to go to his master, Thomas Ald, who had rented him to Covey for one year, and asked for help. He walked to his master's, but his master sent him back to Covey the next morning.